Amen, amen. God is with us always, and he is faithful. Amen? Amen. Well, we invite you to join us as we worship this morning. Darkness, we 
Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God All my life And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so the goodness of God in your life before? Me too. And uh, it's moments like this where we can pause and just recall the goodness of God because life has a way of reminding us of all that's wrong and all that's hard and all that we wish was different. But in moments like this, in gatherings like this, we just get to stop and thank God. Thank God for his goodness to us. Where would we be without it? I know my life would look so much different had God not extended the goodness and faithfulness that he promises us into my life on a daily basis, even in the midst of hard things, we still experience the goodness of God. And one of the ways that we worship here at LBC is through giving back to him. And uh, it's just a small part of what we do, 
but we think it's, a, it's such a beautiful opportunity for us to partner with God, to join with God in what he's doing in our church and in our community. And so each week we pause and we just give thanks for all that God has given to us and give back to him. And we have a simple little blessing box in the middle aisle. If you wanna partner with us, you can drop your gift in there. You can give online, it's up to you. But I can assure you that God is doing incredible things through your faithfulness, through your generosity. You've heard so many of those stories and there's more still to come. And so we pause in this moment and we just thank God. So join me now, if you would, in prayer. Father, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for these beautiful people whose lives are probably messy, challenging. There's things that we wish look different. There's things that we want more of. There's things that our hearts long for. But in this moment, it's about you. All of life is really about you. So we just pause and we just simply say thank you. We're not asking you for anything. We just simply say thank you. Thank you for all that you've given to us. Thank you for all that you've entrusted to us. Thank you for the significance of this church and this gathering that happens here each week. But apart from you and apart from your spirit, we have nothing. And so as we give today, just like we did last week, just like we'll do again next week, we do so with expectant hearts, expecting that you will do exceedingly more than we could ask or imagine. Thank you for your faithfulness to our church. Thank you for your faithfulness to our lives. We bless you, we honor you, we worship you, and we sing to you now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. like a river wash over me immerse me in water as deep as the sea
as we sing this, let this be our prayer. Oh, Lord, send revival. Lord, send it now. The move of your spirit. Heaven, pray, God. Come now in power. Cover this land like you done it before. Would you do it again? See it again. Lord, send revival. Lord, send it send revival God we need you it is you has given us the very breath in our lungs Father we look around in our city in our state, in our country, in our world and we see that this world desperately needs you your word says that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways. You will hear, and you will hear their, heal their land. So, Father, we ask and we plead and we pray, send revival. Use us. Send us. Pour out your spirit. Father, help us to be the light that you have called us to be. Help us to love others the way that you first loved us. Help us to lead a life that is an example of who you are and what you've done in us. Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for who you are and all that you've done. We thank you for your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Well, thank you to our worship team. I know that that last song was, it was new to me, um, maybe to some of you as well, but uh, man, Austin said it well, like, what a great prayer, what a great um, plea that God would send revival, and if you, if, you, uh, if you pay attention to what's happening in the world, and, and when I say that, I'm, I'm not thinking even in particularly about, you know, the, the situation in Ukraine and that part of the world, I'm just thinking worldwide, uh, God is doing amazing things, and there is revival that's happening. Um, It's interesting to me that America, the U.S., in so many ways leads the way in so many different capacities, Um, but spiritually, we're always the last. I don't know if you've noticed that. Um, God is is awakening hearts around the world, um, and... uh, America's a slow adapter, <laughs> and so that prayer is, uh, is a good prayer. In fact, you know, statistics are statistics, right? But um, it, it's, it's rumored that um, there are as many missionaries imported into the U.S. as the U.S. is now exporting to other parts of the world, which is just crazy to think about. Um, anyhow, tangent, free, food for thought, right? <laughs> Um, before, uh, before we go further, I just want to say, first of all, I'm glad to be back with you and to, to start this new series called For the One, which I'll elaborate on in a moment. But before I do, I, I think it would just be dishonoring for me not to pause one more time and just to thank Preston and Brent, who uh, spoke the last couple weeks. Uh, if we could just thank these guys. They're both here this morning. Um, just very profound, very meaningful truth that I hope, uh, that I know greatly encouraged and challenged me, and I hope it did you as well. And I also want to take a moment to remind you uh, just that at the conclusion of this time, we will share in a time of communion together. Um, And so if you did not pick up the communion elements on your way in, uh, feel free at any point to jump up and grab them. You'll need those. uh, If you choose to participate in communion, you'll need those at the end of our time. And it's absolutely no problem whatsoever to jump up and get those if, if that's what you need. So, With that said, we are here and we are starting this series called For the One. What is this all about? Well, you probably likely remember that just about three weeks ago it was, I think we wrapped up a series entitled Better, in which we kind of walked through the book of Hebrews in its entirety, right? I think it stretched out maybe over 16 or 17 weeks. Um, I personally loved the series, but I probably have a little bit of self-bias in there. Um, but I, I just found it to be so enriching for me at so many levels because, you know, you see the 40 minutes or the 35 minutes or whatever it is that I'm up here and, and we're kind of sharing this time together. But for me, in order to be able to stand up here, I have to just spend quite a bit of time studying and reading and preparing my heart. And so when you do a series like that, you spend a lot of time thinking about Jesus and you really can't go wrong doing that. There's a lot of upside to that. And so it was really uh, enriching for me. Um, Hopefully you got something out of it along the way. Um, So as we started to get towards the end of that series, naturally I started thinking, well, what's next? Like, where do we go? And when I looked at the calendar, I realized, okay, Preston's going to share, Brent's going to share. And then by the time they've shared, we're three weeks out from Easter. And then I asked the question, well, what's the best and the most strategic use of those three weeks leading up to Easter? Well, if you've been around a church, not this church, because this church hasn't been around that long, but if you've been around a church for any length of time, you've probably experienced that as Easter starts to get closer and closer, churches start to place a greater and greater emphasis on inviting people to church. You experienced that before? Because most of us know that Easter is often one of those Sundays that quite a few people who normally might not attend a church service might attend on that particular Sunday. And since churches know this, the weeks leading up to Easter seem like a good time to emphasize the importance of inviting people in who are disengaged spiritually. They're, They're disengaged from Jesus, maybe they're disengaged from a local church, like And we're not saying, do they have faith? Do they not have faith? We don't know necessarily. We're just simply saying they're disengaged. Faith, as we would think of it, is just not a part of their life. 
It's not a rhythm of their week in terms of going to a local church. And so the, the weeks leading up to this, churches know this, and so we start leaning in on this idea of inviting people, inviting people, inviting people. Well, I'm gonna make a statement that is going to seem a bit audacious, maybe, and perhaps even a bit bold, but I hope that by the end of this really short three weeks that we're gonna be in this series, it will seem less audacious to you. It will seem less bold because I think you'll have a clearer picture of all of this and some concrete evidence that hopefully will support this statement. And the statement is this. What many, and, and not all, but what many churches prioritize pre-Easter, I believe with my whole heart, defines who LBC is year-round. I'm gonna say it again. What many churches prioritize pre-Easter, I believe with my whole heart, defines who LBC is year-round, which is what? It's this. We are a church for the one because of the 99. Now, that may not make any sense to you at the moment. Hopefully it will in about 20 minutes. We are a church for the one because of the 99. What does this mean? Where does this language come from? I'll show you. you actually, I won't show you. You're not gonna see it on the screen. I'll tell you, that's a better way to say it. In the Gospel of Luke, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, one of the four Gospels that really just kind of stand up the life of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus, the Gospel of Luke, specifically chapter 15, Jesus tells three parables. A parable was simply a short story that's used to illustrate a spiritual truth. That's it. That's all a parable was. One story that Jesus tells is of a shepherd who has 100 sheep, and one of them wanders away and gets lost, and so he leaves the 99 to go find the one. The second story, the second parable that Jesus tells is of a woman who has 10 10 silver coins that are very valuable. They have a lot of value. She loses one, and the, the story, the parable is, is that she basically searches the house over high and low until she found the one missing coin. The third story, and perhaps the one that most people would be familiar with, is the story of the prodigal son, or some might call it the lost son. A man has two sons, one takes his inheritance early and basically goes off and makes a complete mess of his life before eventually returning home to the father. And by the way, I'm giving you the cliff note version of all three of those parables because in two weeks from now, which is week three of this series, we're gonna kind of dive into those a bit more in depth. And so you have these three stories, these three parables, and they all follow a very similar plot line. Something is lost, something is found, Well, then how do they all end? They all end the same way. Whatever was lost is found, and the response is the same in each, and it is a response of great celebration and great rejoicing. Okay, so what was the point then? Let's ask the question, what was the point that Jesus was trying to make? I mean, these were parables that Jesus essentially made up. I mean, they're, they're stories that are trying to illustrate a spiritual truth. Jesus was using figurative storytelling language to try and convey a truth. So what was it? What is the truth that Jesus was trying to communicate by telling these three parables? By the way, and I'm going to give too much away for week three, but oh well, act surprised in two weeks. They start because, they, because Jesus is dining with like tax collectors and prostitutes and people who are not of the religious elite, if you will. And they were like, whoa, what's, what's the deal here? Tell us, justify yourself, Jesus. And Jesus says, better yet, I'll tell you three stories. <laughs> and then he tells them these three parables. What is he trying to communicate? I think... He's trying to give us a window, a picture, a view into his heart and his ministry, and that was this. Jesus was for the one. Jesus was for the one. Now, I'm borrowing that language from the parable. Man has 99 sheep or 100 sheep. One strays, 
One gets lost. Woman has 10 coins. One gets lost. A man has two sons. One wanders away. I'm borrowing that language from Jesus' peril. Jesus was for the one. And so are we as a church. All of the time, not just at Easter. But rightfully should you ask, okay, but aren't you using the three weeks leading up to Easter to make this point? <laughs> like, isn't that what you said most churches do? Y- yes, you're correct on all, all counts. But here's why I'm doing this. Not long ago, we had a, our leadership uh, team was, was together and we were just chatting and we were talking about how, you know, the church has grown and a lot of new faces and a lot of new people and it's incredible to see that. But we had this realization that apart from our initial, what we called our launch team, we had had many new faces join our church, many new people start to engage with us, and yet we had not really, since the early days of our launch team, we had not really gone back and kind of recast the vision for our church since those early days to all of these new friends, many of whom are you, that have joined us. And so if you can imagine, go back to a time that we would now call pre-COVID, okay? Can you picture that? PC. You have AD, you have BC, you now have PC, pre-COVID. We had just started out of the gate. I mean, we, (laughs) wow, we had no idea what we were doing. We also had no idea what was coming, which was COVID. Absolutely no clue. Nobody did, right? But we had this incredible group of people who we called our launch team. In fact, if you are here today and you were part of that original launch team, would you raise your hand? Come on, don't be bashful. Let's, let's love these people. Come on. <clears throat> I, I am, I, I'm very proud. This is a proud statement that I'm about to make that, I don't know, maybe as high as 98% of our original launch team is still with us. They're still with us. Incredible people. Because what you need is you need an incredible group of people who are willing to kind of step out with you, step away from what's comfortable, step away from what's familiar, into something risky, into something messy. And I should note that all of them did so with absolutely no awareness of what was coming, COVID. And yet, even when COVID hit and our plan was completely shredded, if you could put something through the shredder like six times just to make sure that it's dead, that's what, our, that's what happened to our perfect church planting plan. I mean, just forward and backwards through the shredder. Similar in your life, you had personal plans that just got shredded. But even with that, they all stuck with us. And here we are today. But I mention them because before these individuals committed to our launch team, We sat them down and we made it very clear to them what we were inviting them to be a part of, what we were inviting them to part of. And we said right from the start, we basically said, look, it's great that you like us as people. It's great that maybe you live in Vail. It's great that you have a heart for whatever you have a heart for. It's great that you like like our music or think our jokes are funny, yeah. That was always the weakest group among them, (laughs) whatever. But you won't love our church and consequently, you probably won't stick at our church if you don't love the one. If If you don't have this burning, insatiable desire to see people find life in Jesus, eventually you won't love our church. You might for a while. It might be right down the road and it's convenient. It's all those things, but you won't, if your heart does not bleed for those who are far from Jesus, those who don't have a church to call home, those who are disengaged, interpret that however it is you want to, those who don't have a community that is with them, and for them, then LBC probably won't be the best fit for you long-term. We wanted to be clear to them then, and I wanna be clear to you today. So many of you have recently joined us, and we thank God for that. 
And so I owe it to you to tell you again what we are all about. This is what we are about. We are deeply committed to reaching, again, to borrow Jesus' language, the one. That person, I mean, you saw the little video that our team made. By the way, I never make anything. <laughs> so anything, you're like, oh, that's cool. I wonder how Rob did that. He asked Austin or Preston or Delaney or someone else to do it. Anyhow, but you saw in that little video just face after face after face after face after face, right? Flashing in 30 seconds. So that person, you, you have a face in mind, I have a face in mind. Maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a coworker, maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's a teammate, maybe it's someone who's just far from Jesus, disengaged from anything faith related. That, that is, that face, that person, that image that flashes across your mind is what puts wind in our sails as a church. And for us, it takes shape in what we would call missional church planting. Now, this is probably an unfamiliar term to some of you, and so I just wanna put the pieces together for us so that we are sure what it is that we're talking about when we use the phrase missional church planting. Believe it or not, the church in, in general, obviously, I'm not talking about this church, we're barely, we're coming up on one year, believe it or not, in Sienega, May 16th, I think will be our birthday. Is that how you talk about it? I don't know. Um, believe it or not, though, the church, big church, has not been around forever. It's not been around forever, right? It's, it's, it's the larger institutional church that I'm talking about. It has not always existed. Yes, at this point in history, it's about 2,000 or so years old, but it's not eternal, it hasn't always been a thing. In fact, it got its start right after Jesus left the earth in what we call his ascension. And most of the history of the first church, most of the history of what we would call the early church is recorded for us in the book of Acts, appropriately named. This is the Acts of the, of the church. This is the Acts of the apostles. Like this, this is the activity that was going on. Okay, well, if they were the first church, they were the early church, then it would make sense for people like myself and for people on our team who are trying to start a church and trying to build a church and try to lead a church, it would make sense for us to take our cues from the first church, the early church. I mean, it seems like they were successful. Well, just like any organization, the church is not immune from a desire to grow, right? I mean, no one starts something, maybe it's a, a restaurant or a startup company of some kind or whatever. No one starts something and thinks, you know, I hope we never grow. <laughs> like, I hope no new customers ever come. I, I hope it's the same 25 people for the next 25 years. I mean, you'd, you'd question, why did you even start the organization in the first place? That's like craziness, right? Similarly, when we set out to start this church, our mentality was never, you know, we hope that no one other than our launch team ever finds us. <laughs> like, we, we had 75 people on our launch team. That's, that's a church. That's big enough to be a church. And so our mentality was never like, you know, we hope that it's the same 75 people in 10 years from now that we started with today. You would just think that's an absolute, complete waste of everyone's time and energy, wouldn't you? And it would be. And so growth has been part of the plan from day one. But again, if we're looking at the early church for our guide, and we're taking plays out of their playbook, then it would be wise to ask the question, how is it that they grew? What was their quote unquote growth model? Well, let's look at it. This is Acts chapter two, verses 42 to 47. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread or donuts, however you want to interpret that, <laughs> to the breaking of bread and to prayer, everyone was filled with awe. Many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together. They had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God 
and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number. Here is their growth model. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being, say it out loud, saved. Okay, so let's make sure we understand what's going on here. You have this group of people who it seems like believe in Jesus because it says uh, they're devoting themselves to things like teaching and prayer and all of them are together, right? The fellowship of the believer. So they have, it seems like this group of people has faith in Jesus and now ascended, resurrected Jesus. And, and th- his gospel message, his truth is spreading like a wildfire and there's activity and, it's, and, and they're coming together and they're doing all of these things, right? It says they're meeting together, they're taking care of one another's needs, they're sharing property, they're reading and learning about God, they're, they're uh, praising God together. All of this is going on. And oh, by the way, as all of this is going on, there's something else that's happening as well. And that is they're growing. How do we know? Because it tells us straight up that the Lord, God, was adding to their number day by day. In the Greek, that means numerical growth. (laughs) That's a joke, come on. (laughs) Thank you, one of you. If If you're having things added day by day, people in this case, what are you doing? You're growing. If every Sunday we added five more people, you would say we're growing. So that's what's happening. They're doing all of these, they're coming together, they're, they're fellowshipping, they're reading the scriptures, they're praying, they're singing, they're sharing meals together, and oh, by the way, they're growing. Okay, so then the next question is, how are they growing? It tells us that as well, by those who are being saved. People who previously if I understand that correctly, if, if, you're, if you're saved, that means at one point you weren't. If you have faith in Jesus, that means at one point you did not have faith in Jesus. Like past tense, this has happened. You went from this state of being to this state of being. The Lord is adding to their number those who are being saved. People who previously had no faith in Jesus now have faith in Jesus and are attaching themselves to these people who have faith in Jesus. You see that? I hope you do. I hope you do because this is like what gets me out of bed in the morning. We want to see, so this is the growth model for the early church. It's it's as clear as I can understand it to be. This was the growth model for the early church and consequently this is the growth model for our church. We wanna see people, to borrow Jesus' language, the one who is wandering, who's searching, who's looking for abundant life, who's asking the questions like, is there anything more to this? We wanna see those people find abundant life in Jesus. That is why our church exists. And those that are on our launch team know that's exactly why um, they sent us out. That's also why we capped it at a certain number for our launch team. Because you know what our goal was never? To empty seats at other churches. Our goal was always to have people come in and join us who had no seat anywhere else before. We don't wanna grow simply numerically. We wanna grow by kingdom impact that more people would be in heaven, that more people would have salvation in Jesus because they know the free gift of salvation and maybe, just maybe, our church played a very small role in that. Which means then that we have to operate differently. We, we, ha- we talk about it on our team, we have a one aware filter which, in- which influences everything we do as a church because we think it's the same filter that Jesus ministered through. And this filters everything, or this filter influences everything we do. It influences what we put on our schedule. It influences what we say yes to and what we say no to. It influences how we set up our budget, what we give our resources to, how we use our social media, how we staff our team. 
It influences everything. In fact, over these next, uh, this next quarter, this next half year, Preston is, is really tasked with diving neck deep into this stuff and asking the question like, how are we doing at connecting with people who are far from Jesus? Where are our blind spots to this? It also means, some of you are very uncomfortable right now, but just hang in there with me because I'm gonna, I'm gonna be nice in a moment, okay? It also means that in five years from now, when we turn around and do a five-year assessment of our church and ask the question, how are we doing? Are we growing? That measure of growth will not be, this is where some of you are gonna be uncomfortable, but hang in there. The measure of growth that we will not look at is how many people left another church to come to ours, but rather how many people had no church? How many people had no faith in Jesus that now have faith in Jesus? Now, as I say that, there's an elephant in the room. And that elephant is that perhaps quite a few of you came to LBC via another church. Now all of a sudden you feel better, right? (laughs) Hear me. We are so glad you came. We are so glad you're here. Because it's more people for us to fulfill the Great Commission. You hear that? If you have faith in Jesus, which I'm not going to assume that if you were in a church before and you found our church, you came to our church, that you necessarily for sure had faith in Jesus, although probably you did and do. So if you have faith in Jesus, We need you and we want you because we want you to be on mission with us to reach those who don't yet have faith in Jesus. We are a church for the one because of the 99. You can't do this. You can't can't do this church planting, missional church planting by yourself. You have to have an army and you have to have an army that's like we are with you because we believe that this is the heart of Jesus. And if that's your story, so I'm talking to those of you who came to us through another church, which is quite honestly a lot of you. If that's your story and you came to us from another church, chances are you had a good reason for doing so. And quite honestly, it's not not any of my business. But my hope is that Maybe, no, maybe some, it was something you recognize, or maybe it's now something you recognize. Maybe you didn't recognize it at the time, but maybe you do now that God was stirring in you a new season and you were simply responding to God. In your mind, it was like, hey, it's closer to home or it's this or it's that, but maybe, just maybe it was a calling of God that brought you to us and connected you into our community, that he had something new for you. Notice I'm not using the word better. That was the last series. (laughs) That was not a playing joke, but I like that. Um, I hope some of you will say something afterwards about how funny that was. Um, I'm not using the word better. There are so many good churches in this city. Some, quite honestly, that you all came from. This is not about better. This is about new and different. God was stirring in you. This is a new season for me as an individual. This is a new season for us as a family. We aren't claiming that our church is better. We're just simply saying it's maybe different. It's new. We have a vision that we think God has given to us and it just penetrates to our very core. And so if you come to us over the last year, which many of you have, I simply wanted you to know what it is that you've come to. You have come to a community of those who are doing our best to follow Jesus and to make as much space as we can for those who don't yet know Jesus as their savior. I believe, this is where maybe I'm different. I believe that those things can and should coexist. Those who have faith in Jesus those who are still on a journey of exploration, everybody has a seat at the table. You can belong before you believe. 
And so whatever brought you here, please don't leave. <laughs> please. <laughs> we are, I, I mean, I don't know if you can like read me from there, but like with all the sincerity in my heart, we are so glad that you found us because we want you to be on mission with us. Now, there's another elephant in the room, which is that some of you are here today are like, wait, this is me that you're talking about. Like, you're, you're talking about me. I'm, to use Jesus' words, as the pastor says, I'm the one. I'm the one who was or is maybe still far from Jesus. To you, I say it is the greatest joy of our lives that you are here. You are not a project to be fixed. Hope everybody's doing okay. Something over here needs to be fixed. <laughs> but you are not a project to be fixed. You are a person to be loved. And there's a big difference in that. You are not a project to be fixed, but you are a person to be loved in the name of Jesus. And my prayer is that as you've connected to us, no matter if you've made that decision of faith or haven't, my prayer is that as you've connected to us, that you, however you've ended up here, that you've experienced the deep love of Jesus through so many of these wonderful people. Our church is for you. Our church is for you. Because I think that's the model and the, and the lens of Jesus. I mentioned earlier the term missional church planting, but I just wanted to define it a little bit more. I read a book early on in this journey of kind of starting out that was extremely helpful for me in thinking about some of these things. It's a book called uh, Planting Missional Churches, which unless you're gonna plant a missional church, you probably don't need to read it. Um, you can, you should. Um, it's a great book. It's by Ed Stetzer and a guy named Daniel M. But here's, here's a bit, here's just one quote that I think will help you to understand this a little bit more. It says, missional means adopting the posture of a missionary joining Jesus on a mission, learning and adapting to the culture around you while remaining true to biblical truth. Missional is a posture. We join Jesus on his mission to people in culture. And I love this last line, good church planting depends on good relationships. Whatever you think of what you experience here on a Sunday, so mostly me standing up here talking to you or, or someone else that's up here, our, our worship team. Whatever you think of that, you can find something better online. I'm just gonna be totally honest with you. There's somebody that's a better speaker, preacher. There's someone who sounds better in terms of worship. There's someone who has cooler facility than we do. But what you can't get online is good, authentic, loving relationships. And that's the foundation of missional church planting, is good, loving relationships. There's a guy named Tim Keller. He's a pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City. And um, he, he also has just been influential, if you will, into some of the things that I've been thinking about but he says this about this whole topic. He says, dozens of denomina denominational studies have confirmed that the average new church, so that's us, the average new church gains most of its new members, 60 to 80% amongst the people who are not attending any worshiping body, while other churches, so over 10 to 15 years of age, gain 80 to 90% of new members by transfer of one congregation to another. He goes on to say the single best way to reach those who don't know Jesus is to start new churches. The, tra the transitional new community creates space for people on the outside to connect inside. And so you ask like, okay, well, why is that the case, right? Like he, and, and this is his conclusion. He says that one of the primary reasons that this is true is because new churches are forced to focus on the needs of those outside of their community or outside of their immediate group of people just simply to kind of get off the ground. 
And so it's allocating resources and people and money that are externally focused in nature because there is so little internally that consumes their time. One of the biggest upsides of not owning our own facility is that guess what we don't spend any time doing throughout the week? Building, maintenance, cleaning. We don't even clean our office. <laughs> if you come, you'll know. It's three guys in there. Whew. Um, we clean it once a month. It's usually when Kendra comes by and she's like, when's the last time you guys cleaned this? <laughs> Anyhow, we, we don't spend that time because we don't have, we don't have those variables. And I love that. Setting up is a beast, don't get me wrong. But there's a huge upside. Because once this is tearing, torn down today, guess what we focus on Monday to Saturday? People. We don't have a building to worry about. I wanna say what a tremendous opportunity that we've been given here at LBC. This, this is what makes our heart beat. This is what fuels us and gets us excited. Remember how Jesus finished each of those three parables with a story of what? Celebration. There is so, so much to celebrate when someone, one, just one, goes from darkness to light in Jesus. And if you were here with us last week, we celebrated five incredible stories through baptism of people finding life in Jesus. Was that not incredible to see? Amen. It doesn't matter if you're a young child, and we had several of those. It doesn't matter if you're a young adult who's had a life of drug addiction and substance abuse. Like, you celebrate. You celebrate when people go from darkness to light in Jesus. You celebrate, and that's the parable that Jesus told. There is so much to celebrate when people make that decision. Well, over a year ago, I, I wrestled with, do I share this story? Whatever. <laughs> well over a year ago, I received an email from an individual that I had never met. I, I, I don't think I've met them yet, still, I should say. Uh, I didn't know their name. I mean, nothing about their you know, name or email was familiar to me. Um, and basically, all the email said was, we are new to the area, and we are looking for a church. Can you tell me? Does your church sing hymns? I'm just going to awkwardly pause here for a moment for you to just sit in that. So I had to make sure I had a refill on my coffee before I responded to their email. So I responded. I basically said, hey, um, you know, thanks so much for reaching out. Welcome to the community. Specific to your question about hymns, you know, they're, they're not something that's a, kind of a regular part of our services, Perhaps very occasionally they might be, but it's not because we don't like them. It's just stylistically, we, we've chosen a different model to go a different direction. In fact, step out of the story for a minute. I personally love hymns. Uh, I listen to them, you know, on my own free time, whatever. The point was, is like, hey, yeah, it's not part of who we are necessarily, but we don't have anything against them. It's just not our, our style. Then I concluded my email by saying this. This is almost... A quote, far more important than our style of music is our vision to reach people who don't know Jesus. If this is what you want in a church, you should come join us. And then I proceeded to share much of what I've shared with you this morning. Friends, to love LBC, which I think all of you do, is to understand that for us, I can't speak for every church, but for us, it's purpose over preference. We believe that the Bible has called us to go and to make disciples of all people. It's often called the Great Commission. To go and help introduce people who are outside the faith, disconnected, disengaged from a community and, and invite them in to hear the greatest story ever told that Jesus offers life and offers it abundantly. We believe that the Bible commands us to go and do that. And part of my role as the pastor, I believe, is to be a gatekeeper to make sure that we don't get lost in the weeds of preferences. Look, you have your preferences of how you would like church to go. I have a trillion preferences 
of how I would like church to go. But for the sake of the one, we set those aside to join Jesus on mission. Notice I didn't say we set aside truth. Notice I didn't say that we set aside the Bible or the commands that we see of what, of what you should do as you gather as a church to give and to sing and to, to serve. I, I'm saying we're setting aside our preferences. And do you know how much time is wasted in the Christian world on preferences? One of the things that I love so much about our church, and I have, I have actual people in my mind at this very moment who are here today. One of the things that I love so much about our church is that I know, and I'm thinking specifically about our launch team, I know that with 150% certainty that there are people that are a part of our launch team that prefer a different way of doing church. But they are also 150% committed to us because they realize that the kingdom of God is not about me. It's not about you. It's not about my preferences. It's not about your preferences. It's, about the, it's not about the ins and outs of how we do or don't do church. It's about helping people take a step out of sin, out of darkness, into the light of Christ's salvation. And all of this is easier to believe. All of this is easier to remember if you can remember this, that each of us were once far from Jesus. Like, you'd be amazed if you just lock in on this. Lock in on this truth that no matter how long you've been in church, no, long, no matter how long you, you would claim to be a Christian and to have faith in Jesus, before you had faith in Jesus, I don't know if it was at age four or 40, but before you had faith in Jesus, you were far from Jesus. There's not degrees of farness. You either have faith in Jesus or you don't have faith in Jesus. But each of us were once far from Jesus. There was a point in my life when Jesus would have looked at me and said, he's the one. Somebody go rescue him. Somebody go tell him about true life. Somebody go extend the greatest invitation ever, which is to follow and to trust Jesus. That was true of me. And it's probably true of you. It's not probably, it is. Even if you were a young child and you're like, yeah, I, I was a good kid. Far from Jesus is far from Jesus. And each one of us were once far from Jesus. And there's a passage in the Bible that I think really illustrates this. First Peter, we're almost done, by the way. First Peter 2, 9 to 10 says this, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. So it's, it's talking to essentially those that have faith in Jesus. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So that happened. Verse 10, once you were not a people, this is, this is the crux of it right here. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You understand what that's saying? Like there was a point where you weren't in this exclusive club of Christianity, as I like to think of it. There was a point where you were not the people of God, where you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So what is your response? Think of the story where Jesus heals the lepers. I don't remember if it's 10, is it 10 lepers? Thanks for the help, okay. Um, you guys expect me to know everything. 10, I'm going with 10, 10 lepers. Jesus heals them. Nine of them flee. One of them turns back and thanks Jesus and worships Jesus. Hundreds of Christians, thank you for salvation, Jesus. See you later. Or you turn back to say, thank you, Jesus, for extending grace and mercy into my life. May I do unto others as well. May, I, may my heart be similarly burdened for those that don't have faith in Jesus. So yes, we're approaching Easter. 
And yes, at the conclusion of the service, someone's going to bug you to take door hangers and hang them on your <laughs> neighbor's door. Unashamedly, we're going to tell you to invite people. Invite your neighbors, invite your coworkers, invite your family. But I will tell you that this is much easier if it becomes a lifestyle rather than an isolated opportunity every year. Like, you sort of can't fake it. Your heart either is burdened for this or it's not. And my prayer is that we would never, ever, ever be comfortable with the fact that there are people who we love and we rub shoulders with every day who, yet, who don't yet know saving faith in Jesus. Like, God forbid we ever be comfortable and okay with that. And so, does this define how you live your life? Has your faith in Jesus overflowed in such a way that this becomes the natural rhythm of your life? You can't fake this. But if you get into the Bible and you pursue the heart of God and you pursue the heart of Jesus and you just pick apart Jesus' life, you will see that his heart was burdened. I mean, elsewhere it says, you know, it's not, it's not the healthy who need a physician, but it's the sick. Like, Jesus understood his mission on his life, which is that those who don't have faith, those who don't know the gift of salvation, the gift of forgiveness, would know that because of his gift. And we are, like it or not, we are the church, and we are his ambassadors to carry forward that mission. And some of you are here today because somebody loved you in the name of Jesus, and that, that's a hook. Like, we don't have an agenda. You can come here as long as you want. You're always welcome. Some of you don't yet have faith in Jesus. And like, I, I don't know where else I want you to be on a Sunday morning other than here with us. You are so welcome. And we unashamedly, like, we want you to have faith in Jesus it would be a complete waste of my time as a pastor if I didn't believe, like, this is the greatest gift anybody could ever have. And so that, that's, that's the mission. And so here's the question to consider as we wrap up. Man, I'm way over time. How am I helping others to take their next step towards Jesus? How am I helping others to take their next step towards Jesus? It may not, listen, it may not be inviting them here yet. It may just be being in their lives. It may just be walking, loving them in their pain and walking beside them in their doubts and their uncertainty. I'm really excited for, ne for next week, week two of this series, because one of the channels that much of this flows through is what we call community engagement. And we're gonna talk more about that. We're gonna extend a really, I think, exciting opportunity to each of you. And I'm not gonna give away any secrets, but after the service next week, we have something really fun planned that is tied to this, um, this value of community service. And, and you're gonna have to be here. Sorry, online folks, you cannot get this in over the internet. Trust me on that. Um, but no more secrets to give away today. Jesus was for the one. We are for the one. Are you for the one? Maybe you were that one. And now you've come to experience the life-changing forgiveness of Christ. Now there's an opportunity for you to turn around and extend the same gift, the same hope to someone who needs the hope of Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this church. We are a collection of people that have come from all over. Some of us as part of this original launch team. Some of us have come from other churches. Some of us have come from no church. And however we ended up here, I believe with my whole heart that you placed us here. There is not one person here today that's here by accident. Would you burden our hearts? Would you give us a deep, deep longing to see our community, our city, our state, our country transformed by the good news of Jesus? We believe that you can do that. 
We believe that you already are doing that. And we want to join you in that mission. And so as we come now to this time of communion, Father, and we remember your sacrifice, the sacrifice of Christ, it's a, it's a vivid reminder to me that there was a point where I was the one and you in your grace and in your mercy and in your love extended the greatest gift ever, the gift of salvation. God, would you lay deep on our hearts today a distinct awareness of our own experience of this grace, our own experience of this abundant love, this abundant life in Jesus. And would you light within us a fire that burns, burns for those who don't yet have faith in Jesus. Bring as many as you can. Bring as many people that would join us on mission to see others walk in the truth and in the love and the grace of Jesus. And so as we remember you, the, the sacrifice of Christ now, would you impress this upon our hearts? In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Well, as part of our service today, we are gonna just take a few moments to, uh, to share in communion um, together. I wanna just take a moment to remind us or to tell us what this is. Um, communion, you, you will sometimes hear it referred to as the Lord's Supper. It's very simply our way of remembering the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Forgiveness is not something that we earned. It's not something we could do ourselves. It's simply the gift of God to us in the form of Jesus, who offered up his life, the savior is the penalty for our sins. Jesus' death is our death, his sacrifice in our place. And he extends that gift of salvation to us as part of faith in him. And so every time we share this time of communion, it's just simply an act of remembrance that Jesus has made the ultimate sacrifice on our behalf. That gift that Jesus gave us on the cross. And the Bible makes it clear to us that this is a time that's celebrated after we have trusted in that gift of forgiveness and that curse of sin has been lifted and we know peace with God. We know peace with God. We are on the other side of that mercy and grace as first Peter reminded us. And so in a moment, if you're here with us today and you've made that decision for yourself, we wanna invite you to share in this time of communion. But I also know, and I'm sensitive to the reality that there are some of you that have not yet made that decision. And I want you to know how glad we are that you're here and that this is an okay thing for you to pass on at this time. And it's not a judgment from us, it's an eager expectation that you would come to know Jesus as your savior. And then celebrating that gift makes a whole lot more sense. And that remembrance, which is what we're doing today. And so you are an honored guest and it's okay to let this time pass if that's true of you. And so I'm gonna give you just a couple moments of quiet reflection as we prepare our hearts before we take the elements together. of remembering the Lord's sacrifice is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It says, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And we take the bread together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's a new way of experiencing forgiveness and salvation. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We take the cup together. 
Jesus, we are so grateful for your sacrifice. We are so mindful of what you have rescued us from. And we ask God that you would continue to burden our hearts. You would continue to use our church that others might experience the true gift of salvation. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for rescuing us. Thank you for redeeming us. Thank you for calling us out of darkness into your marvelous light. We love you. Commit our lives to you. We ask your blessing on this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. join us as we close out our time together to singing one final song of worship together.
a mighty shout of praise to our God who is worthy. Amen. 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 Oh, amen. I think we just got to make a little bit more noise for God right now. What do you guys think? Can we do that? Like, that was, that was amazing. God is here with us. He is moving, and we could not be more overjoyed than to be in this moment right here with you. And, I mean, I just got to tip my hat to Rob. You know, what an amazing message and the power of, of the one and, and that message that he gave. And if you were not burdened by that, of knowing that people are without Christ and the hope of him, just remember your own story. I hope that just fuels you guys. But you guys, we, we are blessed every single week that we get to come here and get to be in community with you. And very similar to that message, we always are intentional in ensuring that we highlight the significance of the one. And in this case, it's the one that's right here, right now, for the very first time experiencing L or even if you're watching online. And for us, we want to take every opportunity that we can get to celebrate and rejoice in what God is doing. And so if you are here for the first time, or maybe you've joined us recently, we would love just to welcome you and connect with you. And the way that that happens is you just take that connection card, take three minutes of your time, that's 180 seconds if my math is right, and go say hey to us at the welcome home table. We'd love just to say hey to you, uh, encourage you, see if there's ways that we can answer any questions or provide you with any resources that will help you and just support you in your faith walk or your spiritual investigation. Let's make the most of today, guys. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. We would love to say hey. Two quick opportunities and reminders I want to throw your way. Ladies, your guys' hangout at the zoo is going to be taking place this Thursday. Invite a friend. It's taking place at 10 a.m. You guys are going to come together. It's a great opportunity for any of the ladies here that are not connected or you are feeling like, you know what, I, I, want, to get, I want to grow in, in some new connections, some new relationships. This is that opportunity. Click on the, uh, the QR code. That will allow you to RSVP. Get to know some awesome ladies here at LBC. And then right after that, you guys are going to go hang out at Chick-fil-A and enjoy some good lunch. Um, make sure you guys RSVP for that. And then finally, we're, day by day, we're getting closer to our uh, very exciting Easter event that we're having here at LVC, which is on the 17th. Remember, this does require an RSVP if you're going to hang out with us for the post-service activities, such as the catered lunch, the Easter egg hunt for kids, the ice cream cart's going to be here. We really just want to put on um, a, a whole spread for you guys, really it all in acknowledgement to what Easter truly is about. And if we have not given you guys enough reminders and notifications and pamphlets, there's cards, there's the door hangers, invite people. Let's invite people to this opportunity to be able to experience the hope that Christ gives. Amen. All righty, guys, I'm going to pass it on over to Rob. I hope you guys have a blessed Sunday. Thank you, Ricky. And uh, so this was already planned, but it's really good because uh, I kept you all long. It's on me. The kids people are gonna be furious at me, so I'm gonna to have to buy them all lunch. But here's a, good, here's a good little gift that we have planned for you. It just works out really well. Uh, we have free coffee mugs. I believe there's this, yes, thank you, right there. Uh, this is really great timing, bailed me out. Hey, as you leave today, if you're a coffee drinker, take one of those with you. They are free. We just want to get those in your hand. Uh, take it, use it, give it to a friend, give it to a neighbor, they are totally free and we'd love to put one in your hands. They'll be by the door as you leave. Also, uh, just a quick note, students, uh, there's been a slight shift to our April plan for all of you. We'll be communicating to you this week. Uh, we have something really exciting for you, but it's gonna be later in the month. Normally, it's the first Wednesday, but it's not this month, so in April, I should say, okay? We are with you, we are for you, we love you, even though we kept you too long today. More importantly, Jesus is with you, and he is for you, and he loves you. Have a blessed Sunday. We'll see you next time.